Ladies and gentlemen, the next session will begin in five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The next session will begin in two minutes.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The next session is about to begin. Welcome back to GlobeSec Forum 2022. Please welcome Patrick Tucker. All right, hello. Hello. <laughs> I am Patrick Tucker, technology editor for Defense One. Joining me today is uh, Margit Vesseger, executive vice president of the European Commission for a Europe Fit for the Digital Age. Commissioner of the competition. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I, I think your program suggests that my name should be Jennifer Baker. She could not uh, be here. She was detained by uh, plane problems. So I'm just going to go ahead and pretend I know what I'm doing. And if you guys could also pretend I know what I'm doing, that would be great. So uh, let's just kick it off. Um, uh, Ms. Vestager, you uh, in your new role are in charge of a lot of things related to how uh, consumers all around the world, including Europe, but also the United States, interact with digital media, how big companies, uh, big social media companies that we're all very familiar with, uh, interact with each other, interact with uh, governments, and also interact with their users. And uh, you have some flagship, uh, or are involved in some flagship legislation that will come into effect in 2023, the Digital Markets Act, uh, uh, and it could be incredibly important legislation in terms of how us, our phones, and these social media companies and other companies we interact with uh, have our interactions in the future. Can you just tell me really quick, what are the broad lines of this Digital Market Act? What is it supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to give fairness because uh, as, as of today, uh, if you are a startup or a scale-up, it's not your idea. Mm -hmm. It's not your work ethic, it's not your funding that decides whether you can make it to your customer or not. It's a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. It's someone who decides whether you can be found, whether you get your data, whether you are uh, capable of, uh, of doing your business and compete with others. So, so what the Digital Markets Act will do is to open the market. Mm -hmm. Because what we call gatekeepers are companies who have the kind of market power that allows them to decide the success of other companies. And this is not fair. Mm -hmm. So uh, the European Parliament's uh, Council have uh, adopted a proposal by the Commission, uh, I'm responsible for it, that would give such a gatekeeper a number of uh, things to do mm -hmm. and a number of things that they cannot do anymore. Uh, they cannot anymore uh, take data from someone on their market platform. Uh, they must allow for a second app store on our phone. Mm. Uh, I think it's absolutely normal. If you're not happy with the shop where you do your shopping, prices may be too high, uh, choices too few, you go to another shop. Mm. That should also be the case when it comes to apps. So it, it will change the digital marketplace. It will open it, it will make it more competitive, and because of that, hopefully also much more innovative. What is some of the reaction? Tell me a little bit about the struggle that you may have faced in uh, creating this and trying to convince uh, technology giants to go along, that it might be a good thing. Well, well, the strange thing is that, you know, first time when I was, for instance, in the U.S. with my first Google case under my arm mm -hmm. uh, and I was walking up the hill, they said, what's that woman doing? <laughs> um, but I think... A lot of things has happened globally. Uh, also, we have the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal. Uh, we have the attack on Congress. Uh, we have a lot of people getting more and more uh, on ease mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to digital. 
So, so things have changed. And then also digital companies, they say, OK, we better have regulation. Mm -hmm. Problem is that when we then come up with regulation, it was not the one they were thinking of. <laughs> uh, but now this is the one they got. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it's important for, for big tech to realize that the tide is turning. Because Europe is ahead of the curve, yes, but only with a margin. Mm -hmm. You know, on app stores, legislation has been passed in South Korea. The Japanese have their legislation. The Australians are on it. Canadians as well. In Congress in the US, you know, important pieces of legislation are being considered. Mm -hmm. so, so even though we don't have a global sort of uh, authority, you know, there is a development of a global mindset that will sort of turn so that we can make sure that technology serves people. Uh, because that is, that is what it's for. So uh, I want to remind folks in the audience, start thinking of questions later on. I'll just, if you have one, raise your hand. We'll send someone to a microphone to you and stand. I, I don't have like a, uh, an app thing in front of me to help you see your questions, but think on them because we want to hear from you. Uh, at some point, I'll, I'll turn to you, raise your hand. I'll point to you, stand, and we'll get you a microphone. Uh, but I also wanted to ask you a little bit about the uh, Trade and Technology Council because this is another aspect of, of what you do. Um, and it aims to spur investment and strengthen our technological uh, sort of industrial leadership. Um, the tech industry right now, as you pointed out, facing a lot of political headwinds. If you look at the NASDAQ, facing a lot of economic headwinds. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Trade and Technology Council and what lies ahead for it in the next year. We, um, we wanted to renew the relationship with, uh, with our US partners. Uh, so we have come up with this council, mm -hmm. and it consists uh, on the uh, U.S. side of their uh, Secretary of Trade, uh, or Ambassador of Trade, their Secretary of Commerce, and their Foreign Minister. Mm -hmm. And on our side, it's my colleague Valdis Zembrowski and myself who's leading it. Mm -hmm. And then we have 10 working groups, so it's really hands-on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just met in, in Paris a few weeks ago. Uh, and one of the things we decided was, for instance, to work much closer together when it comes to standards. Mm -hmm. This may sound as a real turn off. This is the most exciting thing that you can think of because standards, they create opportunities for businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things where we would like to push for a common standard is in charges for e-cars. You know, it has taken us, what, two decades to get to a situation where we need legislation to get to one charger for all our phones and gadgets. Imagine if we could start out the e-car revolution by having one charger. That would give completely new market options in the US here, and that standard would then spread. And I think that kind of coordination is what we need. Practical, business-friendly, creating a room for innovation and, and more jobs. A um, second example could be that we agree on principle to prevent subsidy raises mm -hmm. because we're already seeing businesses, they travel to the US, they say, what will you give? Mm -hmm. And then they come back to us and they say, they will give so much, so what can, what can you give? <laughs> and, uh, and we're talking about taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. So we now have agreed that if aid is given, it must be necessary, proportional, and done in an appropriate manner to, to prevent distortion of competition. Mm -hmm. and, and I think these practical things are really good. Um, and then, of course, we, we get to know each other. Uh, and, and the fact that we were so fast on the sanctions uh, against Russia mm -hmm. was also helped by the Trade and Technology Council. Mm -hmm. Because so many people had met before. They had each other's email addresses, phone numbers. And I know it sounds trivial, but it's much easier to get things done when you know one another. This is also why it's a good reason to come here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to the standards thing. I think that that's uh, actually really important. It totally is a kind of stealth issue that a lot of people aren't paying uh, a lot of attention to. But uh, there's a, a ton of concern, depending on who you're talking to, particularly if you're talking to Washington and national security circles, mm -hmm. about standard setting and certain players, particularly China, and the influence that they might have setting certain standards for the future and what that might mean. So how do you, in, in having this standards discussion right now about electronic vehicles, uh, but in the future about a wide number of things, how do you make sure that 
entities that are already market leaders don't go ahead and dictate terms for everybody else and solidify their position as market leader and thus lead to unfair competition? Well, we have a, uh, actually a very nuanced system with standard setting commi uh, committees or industry-led. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen is that a lot of these committees, uh, they have been, if not fully, then really hardly hard influenced by China. So now we have made an alert system so that we alert one another when a um, standard setting procedure is coming up mm. so that we can join forces so that from our perspective, uh, a standard will be set. Because uh, talking about security, uh, the differences between uh, us setting the standard for facial recognition and someone else setting the standard for facial recognition, I, I think that is really obvious. And, and, you know, it's a, it's a merger between a war room and a spreadsheet, uh, and that will keep us effective mm -hmm. uh, so that we know when to, when to show up, when to encourage businesses uh, to show up uh, and do their bidding. Is that something that you're seeing? Is, is uh, China attempting, or Chinese players, attempting to kind of try and run standards governing bodies? And so you find yourself in the role of presenting a little bit of pushback to that? Um, or is that not a concern from where you sit right now, in terms of what you preside over? Well, for, for us it is a concern, mm -hmm. because standards, they create business. Right. But values also travels with standards. Uh, because, you know, if values are sufficiently important, then you see them in what you do. So uh, to improve uh, business options and to see that our way of looking at the world actually is a real thing, not just in speeches and uh, what have you, then uh, we need to have a completely different push in, in setting standards, in particular when it comes to technology. Excellent. Uh, so we do have some uh, time for audience questions. We have one right here in the, in the center. Uh, if we can uh, get that young person a, a microphone, that would be great. Uh, okay. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, please introduce yourself as well, please. Yes, uh, Lucia Yara, Euractive Slovakia. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President, for coming, talking to us. Uh, my question is regarding uh, the new legislation that the European Commission is working at, and it's the contribution or potential contribution of uh, giant uh, or tech, tech giants uh, into the building of networks, uh, also in Slovakia, building of Bro uh, broadband or mm. building of new 5G networks is, is a, a costly uh, element or issue. Uh, what is the stage of those preparations and how do you see that those tech giants could do such contributions and what could be the time frame for it? Because certainly it, it will take some time. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. Um, it will take some time. Uh, because um, what we're trying to learn right now is uh, sort of who, who should have the financial burden of uh, enabling connectivity. Uh, because I think a bit 55% of all traffic uh, in our networks comes from the giant global players. That enables their business. Otherwise, uh, there would obviously be no business. And, uh, and so far, it's a, there are, in, in some instances, a commercial relationship, so that there is a bit of payment. But the telcos, who would typically do the entire investment themselves, uh, run the networks, um, they are in a weak negotiating position when it comes to having that contribution. So right now, we're trying to learn uh, how does this play out, uh, what, is, uh, what is the scope, what is going on already. Uh, and would it be reasonable? So we are quite far away from tabling a proposal, uh, but the point is to signal that this infrastructure uh, is important and, and it, we should enable businesses uh, to take responsibility for the infrastructure and not just sort of uh, accept that our telcos, they will forever just be infrastructure managers and not technolo um, tech companies because that, I think, is the most pro promising venue that you can take uh, as a telco these days. Uh, other questions? There's one right there. Please stand and introduce yourself, thanks. Uh, Giga Turk from Slovenia. 
I still remember the internet as it was in the 1980s, early 1990s, when it was free, it was open, it was the same all across the world. There was no regulation. Uh, now we see the balkanization of the internet, the Chinese, the Russian, maybe the European, maybe the American. My question is the following. Also in the light of Ukrainian crisis, also in the light of uh, enhanced collaboration uh, between the European Union, United States, the West. Do you see a possibility that the somehow heavier handed approach of the European Union to regulation of the internet and the somehow lighter handed approach of the United States could be harmonized so that we at least in the West could have a single, more or less single rules, one set of rules that would govern the internet, the platforms, um, and this uh, incredible, incredibly useful invention. No, I, I, I remember those days as well. I <laughs> uh, remember having my first computer and, and, you know, it was black with small yellow letters and we had the printer with the holes in the side and, and I feel 120 years old right now. Uh, I, I think there are, there are two different things uh, at play here. Uh, there is the internet as such. Is this a, still a global phenomenon? Because this is what we want it to be. Um, and then there are the businesses that uses the internet, the service providers. Uh, and here, uh, as I see it, um, now we have reached maturity because it's, it's, it's not the same anymore. And, uh, and with maturity also comes, you know, a framework, things you have to live up to as the telcos, as the financial sector, as energy, uh, as mobility. Uh, and this, the, the point is also here that as digital rose from something minuscule to taking up hours and hours of our daily life, you know, it sort of pressed away democracy. Because what was decided in the analog physical democracy was never really a thing online. And with now the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, Data Governance Act and Data Act, and, and the legislation on artificial intelligence, democracy is coming back and sort of saying our elected representatives, they should also have a say in the digital part of our lives because the two things are so completely interwoven these days. And the timing for democracy to come back, and I think for some with a vengeance, uh, is excellent because from now on everything digitalizes. We have the first digital war where everyone has a camera to document war crimes, to document damages, but also to be the victims of propaganda and manipulation, uh, to share information, to give information uh, and to stay in touch. You know, the Ukrainians are amazing. They are really digital front runners. Uh, they moved their entire state's administration uh, to the cloud within, I think, the first week, 10 days, uh, with the help of amazing companies to do that. Their tax uh, system worked from, uh, I think, servers in Poland. So, so things are changing. The first digital war, energy comes digital, transport digital, agriculture digital, everything's go digital. Imagine that there was no democ democratic say in that process then citizens would lose out. And I, th I think you are seeing something, though, to uh, the point that there's a bifurcation that's occurring now that uh, people didn't anticipate, certainly in the, in the 90s and the 2000s, particularly around balkanization, where the Internet is becoming freer for us in the West. But in just the last few months, uh, you've seen um, basically a new firewall occur around around Russia. And uh, for folks like me in the media, we've been watching Russia sort of slowly erode uh, the uh, availability, the existence of the free press. But just in the last few months, you've seen them now block a ton of social media activity, a ton of social networks. And of course, there's all of these new laws restricting speech. Um, so I wonder if you could uh, first talk on is there a role for the EU in countering that, in countering a more closed Russian internet? Uh, should there be? Because obviously the messages of, uh, of the West and also the uh, things that journalists are documenting, that needs to reach audience in Russia in order to affect any sort of political change, perhaps in the far future. Is there a role in the EU in that? Uh, and then I would also ask on the sanctions 
that have uh, recently been put in place. Might those have the effect of just accelerating that isolation that we're now seeing in Russia and perhaps even undermine the ability of people in Russia to eventually push back on Putin's rule? I, I, I think these are very difficult questions. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> but nobody I, to say that is just to say that we have discussed this a lot mm -hmm. uh, because the difference between uh, manipulation, propaganda and media freedom of course, this, this is a balance to be kept. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you have access to media in, with plurality, with different views, with you know, well-researched uh, articles, fact-based, uh, but also, of course, with, uh, with op-eds and opinions and what have you, mm -hmm. uh, you can form your own opinion. Mm -hmm. But if you're constantly being you know, told basically just one thing, mm -hmm then uh, there is a high risk that you're the victim of propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that propaganda has the obvious purpose of, uh, of polarizing Europeans yeah. within communities, within countries, within Europe. Uh, and I listen a lot to, to my colleagues, for instance, Vera Jourova, my Czech colleague, uh, other colleagues who grew up with state propaganda. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they are, I think they have developed a, s a special sort of sensitivity as to when things may be going the wrong way. And here, their advice was obvious. We need to close down Sputnik Russia today, and we need to move further on, because this is, this is not media. This is not media freedom. These are specific categories. They're used for war purposes. Mm -hmm. And they have been used to prepare the war through months and months with no end. Mm -hmm. uh, and we should not let this investment pay off. Um, and I really uh, think it was, it was well said uh, by the president of, uh, of Slovakia uh, this morning that our values, freedom of speech, should not be turned around as a weapon against us. Uh, to accept whatever propaganda, uh, whatever manipulation that comes out uh, in social media. Yes, but that's uh, the issue with, with freedom of speech. It's incredibly hard to, uh, to control and its very existence can lead to democracy. And democracy is an argument uh, often. Uh, and so it, that line is something that we're going to continue to talk about forever because that is the nature of democracy. Um, other questions? from the audience. But Let's just may Oh wait, well, sorry, go when ahead. The, when the, while the, the microphone travel, uh, I think it's really important to keep insisting. Um, I know here in this region, uh, there's a lot of uh, people who speak the language so that mm -hmm. the communication is easy. But for instance, there is a couple of Danish papers mm -hmm. uh, who've been translating their articles into Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, so to enable uh, that you can see what is being discussed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Denmark is not a neighboring country uh, to Russia, but that could be, you know, interesting things, relevant things to say, okay, this is how we look through Danish eyes. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot can be done on the long term to enable people to form their own views. Mm -hmm. But I find it legitimate to, to act against mm -hmm. the manipulation and the polarization of our societies. Okay, we do have a question over here. Uh the microphone has traveled. Please stand and uh, say who you are. Yes, my name is Rand Walsman from U.S. I uh, thought I recognized you, Rand. I <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, social media is about to undergo a radical transformation with the coming of virtual reality environments. So as social media moves into virtual reality environments, a lot of things are going to change, and a lot of things are going to change for the worse. Mm -hmm. So my question is, have you considered, for example, uh, what kind of changes pretty radical changes will need to be made to the privacy laws because, for example, in virtual reality environments, the type of data that's being collected is nothing like what's going on today. You have different multiple streams of different types of biometric data which will be collected, and there's all kinds of problems with that, right? And then there's a slightly different issue about um, the whole nature of disinformation operation. The influence operations will change because the opportunities for doing emotional manipulation in a virtual reality environment are way beyond what you can do in classical social media. I'll call it by now classical social media. Um, so I wondered if you guys have started to uh, consider those problems. So, you know, disinformation is about to, you know, this is the next frontier. I mean, things are really going to go to the next level, and it's going to be very, um, 
Very unpleasant, especially if nobody starts worrying about it until it's too late, just like we did with regular social media. Yeah, excellent questions. Yes, um, and we've been asking ourselves uh, the same questions um, because um, it's, it's already here. Uh, well, I'm not, to your surprise, a gamer myself, uh, but a lot of people are, and they are already, uh, many of them, in a virtual reality. So it's not something in the far future. It is something that has started and it's here already. Um, so far, uh, we do think that uh, the GDPR, so our privacy rights, uh, will take us quite a good step of the way, uh, but we have not finalized uh, that. Uh, and we also think that the Digital Services Act uh, wants into effect, and the Digital Services Act is what will make um, um, sort of uh, digital services uh, take the responsibility for the effect of their services? Are they uh, damaging in themselves or can they be used uh, to undermine our democracy? But also will uh, oblige uh, platforms to have systems so that illegal content, including hate speech, can be taken down while protecting freedom of speech. We still think that that is part of the answer, uh, but we will watch this uh, really closely. Uh, also, of course, to see if our competition rules are strong enough uh, to cater for uh, competition in, for instance, a virtual mall. Uh, because it may be very difficult uh, for people to make free, informed uh, choices, exactly, because uh, manipulation may be so much easier. So, top of mind, but we think we have the basics uh, in place. One of the things that we've been discussing within the Trade and Technology Council is also to work together on uh, privacy enhancing technology. So to be able, uh, both systematically, but also to enable people to have tools uh, in order to preserve their privacy. What do those tools look like? Because I, I mean, uh, uh, a lot of European legislation has been really important in building some sense of, of privacy for social media users, the ability for me to go to Facebook and download all the data that uh, Facebook has on me is because of German legislation, it's not because of something mm. we passed in the United States. And the US is looking sort of in that direction. Obviously, end-to-end -end encryption ensures privacy of a certain way. But what are future digital privacy tools? Because that can also play a role in preventing misinformation and also preventing exploitation. Well, building on and not changing a, a dot uh, or a comma in, in the GDPR, um, the, the Data Services Act takes things a bit further. Okay. Uh, in order for uh, consent to be clearer. Um, anyone here who has read terms and um, any time, any recently, you wow, that's quite good. In an audience this size, normally no one would have read uh, the terms that we sign up for when we use whatever uh, social media. Um, it will have to be something that is for real. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that we can enable people to have, you know, the empowerment that comes from privacy without technology to help us. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's too much. Mm -hmm. You cannot ask people to do their cookie setting, to, to read the terms and conditions. Uh, life is too short. Mm -hmm. And, you know, dinner on the table and the kids will have to go to football. Uh, so, so we need technology to come in and help us. But we had made things simpler and stronger with the most recent legislation. Uh, we've got time for maybe one or two more audience questions. We'll go over here to uh, this young lady. Keep, please keep your hand up so we can find you. There we are. Please uh, stand and introduce yourself. Thanks. Hello, um, my name is Adriana Karas. Uh, I'm from Euronavigator from Croatia. And uh, my question is regarding the Digital Markets Act. So we're going to back, go back a little bit. Um, I was wondering, uh, so you said that um, the aim is to um, basically block the gatekeepers and enable smaller players to come into the game. So I wanted to ask you, will this make us vulnerable um, to uh, new threats such as um, security and data encryption? Because um, those standards have not been harmonized yet. So we if we have a lot of smaller players, we also have a lot of uh, different uh, styles of encryption and uh, data protection. Well, I, I think it's, it's neutral uh, when it comes to that question because 
it's, it's already the situation today. And um, right now we have, for instance, we have different app stores. Uh, and I don't see any reason as to why uh, a second app store on your phone uh, should be less secure. It may have different features, uh, it may offer you different things, but and there is there is no pressure. You don't have to do it. Um, and and what we have found, for instance, we just sent the statement of objection to to Apple on the use of the NFC, so the near field communication. And uh, and here we've really gone in depth uh, because part of the defense was to say that no, for security reasons, we have to keep this to ourselves. We we could not find these security reasons uh, justifying those kinds of competitive restrictions. Now, of course, it's preliminary. Apple will have to answer to this. But, but we think it's really important to be open, direct, ambitious when it comes to security, but not sort of say, OK, then everything else falls. Because that is to give it too much. And, and something I, sometimes I think we scare away, because it sounds technical and dangerous. Uh, so no. Open, ambitious, transparent, let's have uh, security and let's set standard for it, but let it not be something that impedes innovation or makes it more difficult to be a smaller company or a scale up. I think we've got one right here. Sam. Oh, wait, we'll, uh, we'll get you a microphone. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Karo Yoriold. I'm coming from Hungary. And uh, you have spoken about propaganda, and we are living very, very difficult years in Hungary, uh, where the hate propaganda is official. It is state propaganda. And uh, is this leg legislation anything against the governmental propaganda? Because, for example, uh, there was a propaganda against John, uh, Juncker. Mm. And we have been, uh, Hungarian Democrats, we have been expecting or waiting some answer from EU. And there was nothing. And the vulnerable people, uh, have, they were standing alone without any support and help, mm. speaking only Hungarian. Mm -hmm. That's a yeah, excellent question because you know uh, there's things that we can do to restrict Russia today and Sputnik and other uh, very clear Russian propaganda channels, but uh, reaching consensus around disinformation and what it is, uh, there's a need for it, but it's also incredibly difficult. It's difficult within the United States. I can only imagine how difficult it is within a European Union with lots of different countries and lots of opinions about what is truth and what is not. So. Mm. Yes, what is the role of uh, the European Union in looking at disinformation and misinformation from governments within the Union? Yeah, well, well part of the campaign against uh, Jean-Claude Juncker was, was not even digital, it was on billboards. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, know, I know it was digital as well, but it's just to say that it was not restricted to a digital environment. You'd also find it in, in billboards uh, in the country. Um, well, the, the history of, uh, of the Union is that in the build-up of the treaties, there was a, a fear that there would be a, a sort of a Brussels power grab mm -hmm. in, in things that were sensitive in forming public opinion. Uh, and this is why there is this asymmetry, that there is almost no uh, sort of uh, uh, competence in our European democracy uh, when it comes to making sure that we have media plurality uh, mm -hmm. in the individual countries. Because that was seen as to be a protection of media plurality. It was never, ever foreseen uh, that member states themselves uh, would want to restrict that. Yeah. Um, now we, are, uh, we both have a proposal uh, to help journalists. Uh, you know, we have these uh, uh, litigations that has the purpose mm. Of uh, uh, yeah, of gagging journalists so that they don't work anymore. Uh, and my colleague Vera Jourova, who's responsible for this area, is preparing sort of the media uh, freedom law in order to see what kind of push can we get uh, when a situation becomes uh, really unbalanced, uh, so that you have either state-owned or or state-controlled uh, media in different ways. 
Yeah, well, as a uh, member of the media and a journalist, I, I, both of those sound good to me, at least in theory. So uh, please join me in thanking Marguerite Festager for uh, this session. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome to the stage our next guest, Casper Kling from Microsoft, please. And also give him a round of applause if you don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for being here. Um, so first, your thoughts on what you've just heard. Yeah, so of course I represent the, the private sector and one of the big technology companies, uh, but as you can hear from my accent, I'm also a European. <laughs> and I think uh, one, of the, one of the areas where we've been trying to adapt to the new reality is to acknowledge that at the end of the day, policy reigns supreme. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think many parts of the technology industry in the past took a position of trying to fight regulation. Uh, we developed a policy that we call Take Fit for Europe, where we actually formulated quite clearly that uh, we need to work constructively with regulators, policymakers, whether at the European Union level or at national government levels, um, and that we accept that in the digital era, in a digital economy, the technology industry is going to be a regulated industry as well. So, I mean, I'm, I'm really sorry that I won't be able to sort of completely disagree with EVP Vestag on this, but I think in many ways, uh, where we are today is about us working closer together with the regulators and accepting that we also, as a technology industry, have to adapt to the new realities, whether we're talking about values, whether we're talking about sort of concerns, or whether we're talking about specific uh, regulations. So. Um, that's certainly the approach we've been taking at Microsoft lately. And that, that applies to the DMA as well. Are there any special preparations that you have to undertake to accommodate the, the DMA or anything like that? No, absolutely. You know, of course, I mean, we will be um, subject to, to the Digital Markets Act, uh, as will we be on the Digital Services Act, on the AI Act. Uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the challenges, but of course one of the opportunities as well, is that for a company like Microsoft, this regulatory wave or regulatory tsunami, depending on how you're seeing it, mm -hmm. uh, that is coming out of, of the European Union, out of Brussels these years, um, is going to have a huge impact on a company like Microsoft. In some ways, it's going to make our lives more difficult. We'll have to be compliant, of course. Mm -hmm. But in other areas, um, you know, it's also going to help us create a level playing field and make sure that we have clearly defined boundaries for how we develop, for example, our artificial intelligence systems. And that, again, brings us back to the starting point instead of fighting or being critical on the regulation, I think we are at a moment now where we have to work closer together, adapt, align, and actually welcome the regulation that's coming forward, whether it's here in the European Union, whether it's in India, North America, Asia as well. Um, I want to go back to this question of uh, standards and standard setting um, and, and get Microsoft's take on it, because uh, do you see in some way that there might be competition for the standards definitions with outside players like China? Would that impact Microsoft at all? Because uh, I'm always surprised by the number of things Microsoft is involved in. Like Microsoft is this uh, huge innovative company with uh, uh, business areas kind of all over the place. Um, do you have a concern about the rising power and influence of China in standard setting bodies? Well, you know, I, I think we heard President Zelensky speak uh, on this stage a couple of hours ago, and of course we're, we're sitting here in Bratislava, not too far away from uh, you know, the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if nothing else, the war in Ukraine has showed, I think all of us, whether we work for the private sector or the public sector, the importance of standing together around common values, uh, you know, democracy, human rights, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, EVP Vestager mentioned the Trade and Technology Council uh, before. Uh, and I think one of the values of the Trade and Technology Council is actually to try and foster collaboration across the Atlantic, including on standard setting, in acknowledging that there might be disagreements between Brussels and Washington, D.C., but in many, many areas, I think we have a common interest in working closer together, including on standard setting. So the short version, uh, short answer to your question is, of course, that for a company like Microsoft or many other companies, SAP, uh, you know, Snyder Electric, European companies as well, the, the more standards, standards you can have or creating sort of a level playing field, of course, makes it easier for us to, to do business. Um, and I think that's one of the areas where we are hoping uh, very much that the Trade and Technology Council is going to create the opportunities. And, you know, Paul, I don't know if you know this, but we actually, together with seven other companies, uh, four on the European side and four on the American side, uh, put together an open letter uh, a couple of weeks ago in support of the Trade and Technology Council, where mm -hmm. 
We had eight companies, we had three principles, and we had nine specific recommendations. And uh, without wanting to go through all the recommendations, just to mention a couple of them, for example, around democratic resilience and cybersecurity, mm -hmm. we really see the Trade and Technology Council as an opportunity for creating a common approach across the Atlantic at a moment where I think we see, not least in Ukraine, mm -hmm. how critically important cybersecurity will be. And the same on artificial intelligence. Um, there's no doubt that AI presents an enormous opportunity, and you were very kind in saying that you are you know, surprised or impressed, I don't know what word you used, about the different areas that we are involved in as a company. I think it's crystal clear that AI is going to have a huge impact, it's going to penetrate every single uh, industry. If we can create a common approach, avoiding biases, making sure that we have responsible AI being developed and deployed, mm -hmm. I think that will be good for the business, but I think fundamentally it's also going to be good for societies, for democracies, and for human rights as well. Yeah, you know, the time to have an idea about how uh, AI ethics principles should exist uh, and make sure that people that are both at the heads of industry and also in government know you're thinking on it is now because once that's out of the barn, then it's sort of too late is, is kind of a, an important thing to keep in mind. I do have the Slido tablet now, so please use the app. If you want to ask questions, you can also raise your hand. We can do it the old-fashioned way, too. I like that, too, when everybody gets to know each other. Uh, but I want to go back to Ukraine for a second and ask ask a little bit on, because uh, you, you mentioned cybersecurity, obviously an enormous story there, uh, but the sanctions too uh, have had enormous impacts on a wide variety of technology players. Uh, my understanding is that Russia now is trying to create some version of Microsoft Windows <laughs> because, uh, or, or something like that, like some operating system to kind of uh, take the business that uh, Microsoft used to at one point have in Russia. So um, can you talk a little bit about the impact of the sanctions uh, on, on Microsoft? And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, the cybersecurity aspect of the Ukraine war, because it, it's huge. And it's another area where you didn't think Microsoft had a big role, but it's actually on the ground all over the place. Yes, so I think the first thing to say is, of course, that we are completely compliant with the sanctions as well, which means that we removed RT and Sputnik also from our platforms. Mm -hmm. um, we will continue to be compliant with the sanctions regime, no matter what direction that it will, will, uh, will move in. But I think th the more impactful area that we've been involved in as a company has been around cybersecurity. Um, and we put out, including recently publicly, a report on, on the kind of activities that we've been involved in. Mm -hmm. and I think, interestingly enough, even before the 24th of February, Ukraine was actually the second most targeted uh, country in the world, uh, only overtaken by the US in terms of the number of cybersecurity attacks. Mm -hmm. And what we saw in the months leading up to the 24th of February was actually uh, an increase in, in the number of attacks, but also in the uh, methodology or the kind of attacks that were being uh, targeting uh, Ukrainian authorities. So more sophisticated, more destructive attacks mm -hmm. that basically had the purpose of crippling the Ukrainian authorities or taking down the critical infrastructure. Now, you know, I used to work for, for government, um, um, but so therefore I will say, you know, whether we like it or not, a company like Microsoft and, and the technology company, we are today among the first responders to the kind of cybersecurity threats that we're seeing uh, online. It's often used on technology platforms. The software we develop uh, are the areas where we see these attacks. So we've been involved from day one in trying to protect our customers, whether they were public or, or private. But I think the interesting thing is also what we've been doing after the 24th of February, which is to work incredibly closely on a daily basis together with the Ukrainian authorities in trying to do our very best in mitigating the, uh, the attacks. I think there's been two interesting uh, aspects of, uh, of what we've been seeing in Ukraine. One has been, and, and I think it's not always uh, sort of portrayed in, in the media, um, where there is, of course, naturally a lot of focus on the kinetic activities on the ground, the tragic events on the ground, but we've actually seen perhaps for the first time, a very close relationship between cybersecurity attacks and kinetic activities, even down to specific targets being initially targeted with cyber attacks. If that didn't, didn't succeed, then afterwards you would have you know, people on the ground trying to take out that specific target. Can you give me some specific examples? I, I, th I think we'll, we'll keep it at that level, but I think the point here is that we'll have, uh, we've really seen sort of a hybrid warfare where those two tracks have been happening in a parallel, and we haven't seen the number of cyber attacks going down mm -hmm. uh, since the 24th of February. But I think the, the, the perhaps the most valuable contribution we made as a company to the situation in Ukraine was actually to help migrate 
uh, the Ukrainian authorities to the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, we've migrated 16 out of 17 of the uh, Ukrainian ministries to the cloud uh, over the last couple of months. And the reason we've been doing this, uh, as I, I don't think I have to explain to anybody in this room, is that in order to provide the latest cybersecurity uh, suite, it is actually much easier for us as a company, as it would be for any of our competitors, to protect data, to protect critical infrastructure if those systems are operating in the cloud. So one of the clear conclusions coming out of, of Ukraine, or indeed some of the previous cybersecurity as we've seen, is make sure you have a cloud adaptation strategy. That is the best way to protect your data sets. And Paul, I'm sure your next question would be, do you have commercial interest in promoting the cloud? And the answer is called, yes, we do. But our point would be, choose any of our competitor, competitor, but choose somebody and make sure you, you migrate your data to the cloud. Yeah. It's not only good for cybersecurity, it's also good for sustainability. Yeah, I, I was not going to ask whether or not you had a commercial interest in enterprise cloud obvious. because I do know the okay. answer to that okay. question. Uh, so uh, yes, going to questions, what could the EU do better to support large corporations like Microsoft to better navigate new regulations? Well, I, you know, I don't want to put words in, in the mouth of the uh, executive vice president, but I don't think it's necessarily the European Union's role to help a company like Microsoft. I think when we look at the regulatory developments in, in Europe, you know, we've said this publicly, I think our main concern is actually how can we make sure that we help the uh, digital ecosystem in, in Europe? Because I think, you know, again, I worked for the government. I think what we've been concerned about in Europe is how do we make sure that we scale companies that you know, we have nothing to be ashamed of in Europe in terms of patents, in, ter in terms of startups, small and medium-sized enterprises, but perhaps we haven't been good enough to scaling those companies so that we have competitors to Microsoft or Google or, or Salesforce. So I think, you know, finding that sweet spot uh, on the regulatory agenda where it, it doesn't become actually more difficult for startups or small and medium-sized enterprises to be compliant with regulation um, and, and I think one of the paradoxes uh, that we've seen in the past is that perhaps in some areas it's been easier for big companies to be compliant than to develop uh, what I would call sort of plug and play products. So those are definitely one of the areas that we're, where we're working with regulators to try and make sure that we also help share our expertise and our insights, including working with uh, thousands of partners in Europe mm -hmm. in getting that right. Uh, I, I want to go back to the cybersecurity question because uh, I think it's fascinating that in some ways, just because of the ubiquity and the spread of Microsoft products, you've become in some ways like a key source of intelligence for militaries trying to understand this conflict. Um, so in terms of the trends that you've seen, you've just outlined that sometimes kinetic attacks will be prefaced by like a cyber attack and that sort of thing. How has the ebb and flow of the conflict changed from February to now? And what are you anticipating on a cybersecurity front for the coming months? So as I said before, I think what we've been seeing in, in Ukraine is a, is a pretty, pretty consistent picture where you know, kinetic activities on the ground, of course, have changed. Mm -hmm. That's uh, not something that I think I'm, I'm, uh, I should comment on. But in terms of the cybersecurity attacks, they've been pretty consistent. Uh, I think what we've been seeing is, you know, specific targeting mm -hmm. of, of institutions, of critical infrastructure, a massive increase, in fact, on, on attacks on critical infrastructure. And again, I think one of the differences in the threat pattern in Ukraine compared to what we see on a global uh, level is in fact how destructive those attacks have attempted to be. Now, the good story is, of course, that, that you know, together with many other companies, together with authorities, uh, institutions, most of those attacks are not successful because, of course, this is an arms race where we're trying to up our game to make sure that we protect uh, you know, customers the best we can. Um, so I think that's the positive story of it. I think the, the challenging aspect of it um, and I'll, I'll come, if you wouldn't mind, Paul, to say a few words about NATO as well. Mm -hmm. but, but I think the concerning aspect, when we look at the data sets, including the data sets that we make public, is, of course, this is not a threat that is um, you know, going down in intensity even before the war in Ukraine. What we saw globally is the number of attacks are, are increasing, the degree of sophistication is increasing. So this is really an area where we need to invest heavily also to protect the societies, the values, the institutions that we have. Um, on NATO, if you wouldn't mind, because of course we're, we're speaking here at, at the Globsec uh, Bratislava Forum, uh, we were very privileged to be involved in, in work uh, as part of the Future Defense and Security Council on the Globsec, where we actually presented a report to the Secretary General of NATO a few weeks ago. And I think 
you know, if we look at, at the geopolitics of technology and the tectonic shifts that we've, we've seen, and going back to, to your point before about how the private sector and the public sector perhaps need to work even closer together mm -hmm. in mitigating the threats that we're seeing in, in, in 2022, you know, one of the recommendations we made in the report to the Secretary General of NATO was actually to establish a high-level dialogue between the private sector and NATO. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that would be helpful in us being able to share insights, uh, threat analysis, also in real time. But if I look a little bit inward and, and try to be a little bit reflective, I think it would also be helpful uh, in order to hold the industry more to account and also explain that in today's world, um, it is incredibly important that the private sector will also lean in and help you know, support and, and, and sustain the institutions that we are product of ourselves. Yeah, this is a, a, an interesting point because for years covering cybersecurity, there was, uh, you, you would run into government officials that would say, hey, we really need to push information sharing. So big companies being able to share information with the government about threats that they were receiving, about attacks that they were getting. Uh, but there was this question about whether or not they would be potentially held liable and, and how their intellectual property would be protected depending on the information that they were sharing. So uh, what you got was a lot of recommendations, a lot of nice things being said about how much more information sharing people were doing. There were no hard mandates about information sharing, and there was a question about whether or not they should exist. So what is next for that discussion on uh, information sharing, protecting intellectual property? Has it finally evolved to the point where you uh, expect to see actual uh, like law that both companies are happy to participate in because they have an interest in protecting and, and, and not being the victim of the same cyber attack that some other company did, uh, but at the same time, uh, that actually works. So, so I think one of the, one of the de big debates in Europe right now is, of course, about, around dependencies. Um, and, and needless to say, there's a lot of focus on dependency on energy. Um, I, I think it is worthwhile just to say that if you look at the broader digital sovereignty discussion in Europe or the discussion around strategic autonomy, I think there is also a feeling of being too dependent on non-European Union technology as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to shy away from saying that I'm actually quite proud of what we've been able to do to support the Ukrainian authorities at a very, very difficult moment. And I do think, you know, migrating uh, ministries into the cloud is absolutely instrumental in helping defend the Ukrainian uh, you know, society right now. But of course, the flip side of the, that coin is, I think, also increased concerns, again, about dependency on non-European Union technology in this area. So if we speak about the digital sovereignty discussion, what we've been, been, uh, been trying to do um, also in the last couple of years in Microsoft is to say, hey, you know, those concerns are valid, they're legitimate, and in many ways, and that goes back to answering your question, I think the role of a company like Microsoft or any of the big technology players is actually to help develop and deploy technology that gives sovereignty to customers, gives sovereignty back to Europe. And that is about transparency, it's about data protection, it's also about data processing, if you like. So there are a couple of areas where I think we need to lean in more and adapt and align with Europe rather than the other way around. Then there are a couple of areas if, if I'm just being very frank, where of course we see the digital sovereignty discussion being translated into regulation that could make it more difficult for a company like Microsoft to provide cybersecurity uh, technology at the level we're doing today. And I think that's one of the areas where we're hoping with the Trade and Technology Council, but also Europe's tradition of continuously adapting sovereignty uh, you know, to the specific challenges uh, along the way. I think the, the, the Rome Treaty was a specific response in terms of sovereignty mm -hmm. at a specific moment. And I think Europe is in many ways best um, capable of defining digital sovereignty in a way that you still have, uh, you know, open trade, you still have the possibility for those companies that are aligning with regulations, aligning with values to play a role. But at the same time, it's also crystal clear that we need to align with Europe, not the other way around. Okay, I, I want to get to uh, the uh, big debate and argument that you'll probably be having for the next five years with the public, with the, within Microsoft and uh, with everybody. And how that is this, how do you see standards for fair AI emerging? Is there, is there a distinction between the way Microsoft views fair AI between legislators and perhaps even between the public and ethicists? 
so, so I think, you know, Commissioner Vestager mentioned the AI Act. Um, and, uh, and again, I'm going to disappoint you by, by actually not disagreeing very much what, with what is, is currently in the AI Act. It, it, it's very close. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's, it's a boring debate. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it is actually quite close to some of the principles we've developed internally as well. So we have an office for responsible AI. We've also taken unilateral steps to actually not provide certain technology to certain customers, facial recognition systems, because we felt that there were too many biases, there weren't too many problems in that technology. So in other words, what I'm trying to get at is we actually welcome to have the boundaries, the red and, life, uh, red and, and left uh, you know, boundaries being established for us so that we can respond to that. I think on the, on the AI side, um, just to add a, a little bit of, I wouldn't call it disagreement, but just one concern in this area, and that goes, goes back to what we discussed before. I think when we speak to some of our smaller customers or partners in Europe, the AI Act is definitely one of those areas where there, is con there are concerns on whether the regulatory uh, requirements could make it more difficult for small startups in Europe to be successful in the digital age. So I think those are, are one of the areas where we will continue to be hopefully a constructive partner as discussions uh, are ongoing on the AI. But fundamentally, we welcome it. We think the focus on high-risk areas, non-high-risk areas is the, is the right way forward. Okay. All right. And that is the future for you. So uh, I want to thank you, Casper, for being here. Uh, we have time now for the next session, which happens in a moment, but it begins with a short video by Benjamin Mueller. So please stick around for that. And Casper, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Paul. Yes. Thanks. <laughs>
Let's get started. Uh, Ms. Poslat, I'd, uh, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Um, how has the war in Ukraine played out online from the perspective of Google with regards to disinformation, cyber intrusions, and other non-kinetic forms of attack? And what lessons, if any, can you draw from the last 100 days in terms of what an appropriate policy framework looks like to combat online misinformation? Thank you so much for your question. But before I get to addressing it, I just wanted to say um, it feels great to be back at Globsec. And it happens at an extraordinary time after two years of the pandemic, but even more so um, because we are in a country that is neighboring uh, with Ukraine. And it feels more timely than ever to hear um, experts from Central and Eastern Europe um, more than um, more than ever. I think like in many, for many other entities, companies, sectors, the war, the, the war has left uh, a very significant um, mark. The way um, we look at it at Google is predominantly four buckets. One is of course protecting um, users from disinformation. Two is making sure that cybersecurity is well taken care of in terms of the um, of the usage of our tools and uh, platforms. Um, three is, of course, humanitarian um, aid. And four is also still the ability to provide authoritative sources, sources of information, um, including in Russia. YouTube is the only big tech platform that is still available. It's not operating on the business side, but it is still providing the availability of content that uh, is uncurated and moderated. So whatever you can see today on YouTube is also available to users um, in Russia. It has been an extremely um, difficult um, time for the, for the region. It had definitely influenced our own um, workforce um, in, the, um, in the region, but I think everyone has been acting under the assumption that we all have to play a part, be it as individual employees and, and companies with, um, with tools uh, like Google. Many lessons learned, and I'm sure we'll be uh, deep diving into it. I don't know if you want to take a break to say hello to Minister Fedorov now, or should I just continue with the response? Yeah, please. Um, being. But um, I think given the two previous discussions that took place on this stage and listening, listening to Commissioner um, Vestiger and um, our Microsoft um, colleague, I think it's also been a big lesson, lesson learned for tech companies. And definitely the question of uh, regulation uh, has been very often um, coming up. I would say we learned predominantly two things. One, we often need legal basis to act. And uh, there is no debate about regulation or no regulation. It's all about sensible regulation that, especially at the time of war, still allows us to react quickly, to react efficiently, and to really respond to unprecedented events, because this is what uh, the war posed in front of all of us. Thank you very much, Ms. Poslad. And a very warm welcome to you, uh, Minister Fedorov. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, greetings and solidarity from Bratislava. Um, I'd, uh, I'd like to, to go straight ahead and, and ask you a question, if I may. Um, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine is conducted in cyberspace as well as on the battlefield. And this showcases the, the dominance of the cyber domain. In the last five years, we've all been warned of Russia's offensive cyber capabilities, and we've seen evidence uh, of it in action. However, the war seems to have been accompanied by a somewhat muted Russian cyber campaign. So I wanted to ask you, did we overestimate Russia's cyber capabilities? Have Ukraine's defensive cyber capabilities simply proved superior? Or is it a case of both? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. 
here, uh, I would like to start with the fact that we have created the Ministry of Digital Transformation back in 2019, back when President Zelensky was elected into office. And at that time, we have created Ukraine's most popular digital product, which is our DIA app and portal. This is a one-stop shop where you can get all or many of the available state services over the app or over the portal. And since the middle of 2019, we had been constantly creating products under constant, incessant cyber attacks from the Russians. And I'm talking about daily unabated cyber attacks. But even still, over 17 and a half million users, even today, are still using our DIA app. This is one of our most successful digital projects in the country. Uh, so the cyber war has been raging all the time. And in January and in February, we have had significant escalations. And all over that time, we tried to create value and just defend ourselves. And not, we never stooped to counterattacking. But when Russian tanks started rolling, when the Russian military started killing our people, we started to respond in kind in the cyber front. And Throughout that time, we have been able to conduct a lot of quite successful cyber operations. We have uh, attack, counterattacked both the Russian informational infrastructure and some key resources. And we, to, to that end, we have accumulated a large community, including companies and individuals and specialists. Answering your question, uh, first of all, on the one hand, we have been able to create quite a resilient cyber defense system throughout these years, which was qualitatively different from what there has been before. We have, as a matter of principle, we said that business has more competence, the private sector has more competence in creating a competent cyber defense system. And this is what we did. We got them on board and we built it together. Secondly, uh, ever since we started developing our DIA app, we have had an ethical hacking and bug bounty program ongoing, which means ethical hackers are authorized and encouraged to find vulnerabilities in our app, and we, we pay them for finding these, those vulnerabilities. We follow in line with the Pentagon's and the tech, leading tech companies' example in this regard, and this is what we do with our products. So when the war started, uh, there were some very powerful cyber attacks, but we were ready for that in terms of cyber. We have had some best practices, solutions, and algorithms to follow. And second of all, we started counterattacking. And all of our tech potential um, that you have come to know has been used to counterattack. And I must say that we have had a number of quite successful case studies, including the case study of RuTube, which is an a Russian clone of YouTube, something that we've been able to put down for several days, uh, several banks and other critical infrastructure services. So it's a real cyber war raging out there, and we are defending very successfully. So answering your question, on the one hand, we have been able to defend ourselves successfully, and on the other hand, we've been able to counterattack because we have brought together a team of over 300,000 IT specialists to that end. So it's, I think it's very important to pay attention to cybersecurity. It's crucial to create a robust cyber defense system. It's very important to bring the public sector on board. It's very important to do bug bounties. It's very important to do digital education. It's very important to invest in cyber defense. It's crucially important to follow the world's best practices. And what we've been doing in the last one and a half years is something that has brought us to this result, but we, this is something that we are continuing to do today. But even despite the war, the, here's an interesting fact, even despite the war, we are still launching digital services, which millions of Ukrainians use. So during the war, we continue launching services. For example, we launched a survey on the DIA app where our users we're answering questions regarding right to bear arms with 2 million answers recording to date. So we are defending, we're counterattacking 
and we are still launching new services and we're also developing new approaches and breaking ground in uh, digital democracy, for example. I think we are getting a once in a lifetime experience and this is something we will be helpful, uh, we'll be happy to share with other partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Fedorov, uh, for, for this uh, enlightening and detailed answer, uh, really focusing on the theme of how to build resilience in a changed world. And there's uh, clearly lots uh, to learn for, for, for all kinds of actors, whether government or private sector. Um, Minister Remishova, I'd like to turn to you. Um, the European Union is a democratic space. And building resilience in a democracy also involves protecting the information space. Um, that has to be balanced uh, with the fundamental right to freedom of speech. Uh, what, in your view, is the right balance to strike between protecting freedom of speech, but also protecting a healthy online information space? Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, my warm welcome to Mikhailo. We met uh, a few days uh, in uh, Davos and uh, Mikhailo there presented how the digital world uh, can uh, fight the oppression and can fight the aggression, Russian aggression, with a powerful tool that the Ukrainians used uh, in order to to fight uh, also Russian propaganda. And I think it, it was a great example of uh, digital resistance. So congratulations, uh, congratulations, Mikhailo, for all your work that you've done during the during this uh, terrible aggression. Uh, as far as your uh, question is concerned, uh, well, I think we should not ask whether regulating global tech is realistic or not. Uh, I think that at this point, we don't have a choice anymore. Uh, we have to go for regulation. My colleague from uh, Google said that we need meaningful regulation. Yes, we need effective, meaningful regulation also for global tech company in order they have a legal base to act. Uh, the platforms we saw uh, during the years that the platforms like uh, Facebook uh, would not regulate themselves uh, and uh, sometimes we lack a meaningful engagement with, uh, with authorities on taking more responsibility uh, or with harmful content. Uh, so the European Union and the national government, uh, government need to take more stringent measures. Uh, the Slovak authorities, for example, uh, we have uh, consistently reached out to social media, to Facebook, uh, with our concerns. Uh, so there has been willingness to work in good faith on mitigating issues such as spread of pro-Kremlin propaganda. Slovak Republic especially is, uh, is vulnerable to, to Russian propaganda. We are, we, we are one of maybe in top three states uh, uh, um, where uh, Russian propaganda is very, very active. Uh, so uh, the aim is towards a good regulation, which, is th uh, which does not leave out uh, input of these companies and finds a good balance on fundamental notions such as freedom of expression. Uh, in the first days of war, uh, in order to fight a Russian propaganda in Slovak Republic, we adopted an uh, um, amendment of Cybersecurity Act. So some uh, some uh, Russian propaganda websites uh, were shut down. Uh, especially, we had a case when contributor to one website what was a Russian spy. He is now uh, prosecuted, and uh, which is a flagrant example of uh, of uh, Russian interest in uh, uh, in Russian enemy interest in uh, Slovak Republic. And uh, in Slovakia, we saw a uh, corrosive effect on our society, on democratic processes, on democratic values uh, that are measured and also documented by Globsec. So, of course, uh, regulating uh, Globsec companies, it's not an uh, easy task. Uh, it's not an easy task to design. So one has to create obligation that would be effective while balancing the right of users, especially freedom of speech. 
And from this perspective, uh, at the EU level, uh, the first, uh, well, the attempt to regulate, uh, to regulate uh, the platforms was the introduction of code of practice. So this was a soft measures uh, that all global tech companies declared uh, they will adhere to, but in some cases uh, it proved insufficient. Uh, so therefore, uh, now uh, the European Union introduced the DSA, so Digital Service Act, and also some member states uh, introduced uh, national regulation, like for example, Germany. In Slovakia, we are also preparing uh, mm, act to regulate, uh, regulate platforms in order to, especially to fight against hate speech, against uh, propaganda, against harmful and illegal content. And uh, war in Ukraine and Russian aggression showed us that this is really the, the last minute, this is the right time to do it. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Minister. Um, I, I have an interesting question that's come up on Slido um, that sort of uh, riffs on this theme and sort of spins it around slightly. And I'd like to um, pose it to uh, Ms. Pozlad. Uh, so we've just heard um, from Minister Remishova uh, how um, uh, there are situations when sort of voluntary practices are, are insufficient and in order to create sort of a consistent harmonized framework of rules, uh, legal regulation um, is, uh, is necessary. Um, uh, the question that I would like to ask um, revolves, or that was asked in Slido that I'm going to sort of uh, improvise on is clearly one advantage uh, that uh, the, the block of liberal states has um, is that unlike authoritarian states, we have a, a vibrant, flourishing and innovative uh, private sector. Um, and that uh, is also a source of, of leverage uh, when it comes to conflict. Um, how, uh, based also on what Minister Fedorov said, how do you think governments can better use the assistance of corporations to secure their digital security? Uh, thank you for uh, this question, I assume, coming from the audience here. Um, so, first of all, again, looking back into what has been happening in the, in, the, in the past three months, there have been excellent examples of how companies like ours were working, um, including with Ms. Minister uh, Fedorov here. So, um, very often, this starts with just using tools that are already um, available. An example of that uh, would be our advanced protection program, where today over 180 entities in Ukraine um, are using this highest standard of uh, protections that are news organizations, government um, agents, agencies, and other high-risk um, users. And I could uh, go on with um, many examples of how we're sharing um, knowledge about threats that we see on our platforms. We also very often go back to governments and try to connect the dots about things that we don't see and we don't understand as a, um, as a uh, tech company. But to get to, to get to the bottom of your question that I feel sh would require a more uh, structural response, um, this is definitely about building platforms uh, where private entities that share the values of, um, of homelands they're coming from, um, could be definitely working on more structured um, ways to oppose those who do not share these values. And I think, again, we've been, we've been talking about values in the internet ecosystem for years, but for the first time we are so, so vividly confronted um, with it. And, um, for example, there is the new EU-US Trade and Technology Council that for now predominantly brings in um, governments together. Uh, we, there, there, is, there is a small industry component. I would see that as an ideal forum that could be bringing together also the private, private ecosystem, um, sharing, um, sharing the, the same values. Because when you look at the scale of, the, of how the internet is used, um, governments are there to guide, governments are there to provide a uh, legal basis, but we are here also to bring in responses at, uh, at scale. And I, I, I hope I, I, sp I can speak on the behalf of the whole industry. Many of us have been ready, um, ready to do that. 
I'm not going to be very, very modest, but I'm going to say again, thank you to Minister Fedorov for awarding Google last week with the Peace Prize um, in Davos for what we managed to achieve together. It's, a, it's of course, um, a deep in the ocean, but, uh, but we're looking forward to identifying even more ways um, to work together today at the time of war, but also at the, for the benefit of rebuilding Ukraine. Thank you for, for that uh, um, a, a useful reminder that when it comes to building resilience, uh, big tech uh, is an ally uh, and, and, and not always the bogeyman it's sometimes made out to be in, in, in the, the world of policy nerds like myself. Um, uh, Minister Fedorov, um, I have another question uh, for you, please. Um, Ukraine's technology sector is, is clearly a major economic asset and a source of pride for the country. Uh, and it also shows uh, just how strategically significant this uh, sector is. It gives you tools to stand up to a much larger power uh, in an armed conflict of the kind we haven't seen uh, in, in Europe uh, for, for, for many, many decades. What is Ukraine's view of how to balance the need for rules in the technology sector uh, with the importance of technological innovation and the strong tech sector? I would like to start with uh, thanking Veronica for what she's doing for Ukraine. She was the first minister who reached out to me when the war erupted, offering help. And we have had some very productive cooperation. And she has received a, a peace prize from our from our people, just like Google. And I would say not that not so many companies and ministers were honored by with this reward. So I wanted to thank Google and I wanted to thank the minister uh, because Google Google also was one of the first to be awarded because please accept our heartfelt gratitude from on, on behalf of our entire people. A very important point was raised here that we are sharing values with the private sector. For example, one of the values is that personal data personally identifiable information does not belong to the state or to the platforms that they put them on. The data belongs to the people and people need to understand that the data are well taken care of, well protected. And we do, we as a state do everything we can in this regard. We also collaborate with Google extensively with, in terms of digital literacy, uh, e-governance and our joint programs and our common driven by our common values help us a lot to foster this cooperation. Answering your question, I think it's going to be quite a difficult road to victory and a no less difficult path towards renewing and rebuilding our country. But we believe in the digital economy. And because, for example, the Russian Gazprom is worth 100 billion and Tesla is worth 800 billion. And this is just one example how one tech company is worth more than most Russian companies taken together. Because the future is with tech. The future is with talents, with bright ideas, and with great management. So it is our goal for companies like Google, for example, to open their offices in Ukraine, to invest in Ukraine. So our goal is to create some of the world's most favorable conditions for technology companies to feel right at home in Ukraine. Uh, we're doing a lot to that end. For example, we have launched one of the most favorable tax and regulatory regimes in Europe uh, for tech companies. We have lower taxes for tech companies. We are introducing elements of English law into practice in Ukraine. We are now building an IP law court we are separately working on improving other elements of venture investment and venture capital in Ukraine. We believe there is no other road for us other than fostering conditions for tech business to grow in Ukraine. And just like the war has shown us, 
all of the most influential tech companies and tech platforms that bear the most influence with our citizens and citizens of the world have supported Ukraine by divesting from Russia and adapting their policies on fighting disinformation, on how to discern the content which is telling the truth from propaganda. And thus, they have become our great friends. So I think it is our mission as regulators to create a sound and reasonable policy and regulation for companies like Google, like Meta, like others, to continue operating in Ukraine and to divest from Russia and to create to come to Ukraine and create tech jobs here. For example, we are also affecting reforms in tech educations because we, by improving our STEM instruction, because the better engineers we have, the more Google will want to hire in Ukraine. The better attack the tech system, the larger they would want to have their office here. The more predictable the legal system and the more rule of law, the more investors will be inclined to invest in Ukraine. So we are ready to compete equally for talents, for a more secure environment. And we will, uh, we will strive to be as flexible as we reasonably can to compete with our European partners because we will want to renew our country as much as possible. We would want to be more free, more attractive for tech companies and tech capital. Thus, this is the path we have envisioned and that we're doing everything to that end. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I have a question for Minister Ramishova, and then I would like to uh, go to the audience to see if there's any questions there. Uh, Minister Ramishova, uh, I suppose the, the, the elephant in the room when it comes to technology uh, policy um, is the United States, uh, which is by far the largest uh, um, technology sector in, in the global economy. Now, the United States and the European Union are close allies. Um, could you offer us some insights as to what technology policy measures should be coordinated between uh, the European Union and the United States? Uh, so far, the European Union has taken a lead in uh, regulating uh, the online information space. Uh, and um, in the European Union, uh, also in consumer uh, protection area or uh, in online world, the consumer is on the first place. So I'm very happy that, uh, that the, the EU uh, started uh, back in 2018 with a code of, uh, good, a code of practice on disinformation that uh, with the European Democracy Action Plan then on Digital Service Act uh, on which political agreement has been originally recently. And uh, it's important that, that the, the, the clients, that consumer, the data users are safe uh, in, the, in the online world. As far as the um, United States are concerned, uh, they, their approach is more, uh, uh, I would say, uh, 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 more freedom than, uh, than regulation. Uh, but uh, I think that um, we, we have been, we, we have seen the, the, um, the terrible effects of uh, disinformation or, or ca uh, campaigns on, uh, we saw it in the US election campaign, Brexit, ca Brexit then in the Ukrainian war, uh, when the deregulation is not, uh, when the regulation is not in place, uh, the the effect impact on the democracy is very uh, very corrosive. Uh, so, as a European, I think that um, mm, I would say that the United States uh, uh, should uh, should approach the the European uh, golden standard. And uh, in terms of regulation, it's the European Union which is setting the golden the golden standard. Also in uh, in um, in online sphere. Uh, but uh, uh, here I would say that uh, regulation will not solve all the problems that we have. Um, first of all, we need digital literacy, digital education. So here also it would be very important uh, at the European level to develop the common curricula on uh, 
uh, digital skills, to measure digital skills in the in the member states, to develop digital curricula uh, for uh, for media literacy in the member states, uh, and uh, also at the national level to develop uh, strategic communication vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, disinformation uh, scene. For example, in Slovakia, what we are doing, we launch a huge national pro a uh, huge national project uh, in uh, developing digital skills in vulnerable groups like senior citizens. Uh, we developed uh, curricula from uh, the, the uh, very beginning to the advanced uh, advanced group uh, in collaboration with uh, the uh, the university. Part of the education of elderly citizens will be also the uh, security because. There is a huge number of online theft, uh, phishing, and so on, and also uh, also prevention um, in uh, f for disinformation. We did a we did a poll against uh, elderly citizens. Uh, it's like uh, two thirds of uh, senior citizens do not uh, never never encountered the the term of disinformation or hoax so uh, they are not to to not used to distinguish between what is what is uh, correct information uh, what is misinformation or disinformation so digital literacy uh, strategic communication at the national level and then the regulation and uh, the regulation should be effective should be sound and uh, should not uh, counter the the uh, innovation, uh, uh, development of in innovation. Thank you, Minister. Are there any questions uh, by audience members? Please. Hi, all. Algorithmic Russification. I'm Ukrainian, sitting in Bratislava with English language interface on my smartphone. I type Bratislava, and what I get? I type Bratislava in Cyrillic script. First, Ru Wikipedia, Russian Wikipedia. Second and third, tripadvisor.ru. How come? I don't have Russian language in either of my devices. I have only indicated that I know English, I know Ukrainian and other languages. And still, I have the first you can, anyone can get to me and see the first result in Russian from Russian Wikipedia. How come? What can we do about it? How can I stop seeing the suggestion from the Russian sites here? Thank you. So that's an interesting technical question. I'd like to supplement that, and I think it's well directed at uh, um, Marta. You, you might not give the precise technical answer, but also uh, someone online asks, uh, working as a disinformation analyst, I see pro-Kremlin platforms uh, which were blocked rising up as new domains. Uh, you know, this is a very fluid uh, domain. It's very inscrutable to, to, to the non-tech wizards. Um, how, how, does, how does Google cope with the complexity uh, and the, the very many domains that you have to consider uh, if you want to sanitize this space and, 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 and protect it uh, against outside interference? So on, on complexity, um, we're not hiding the fact that it has certainly um, grew in the past um, three months but but then again i think we are pretty quick at um getting ourselves um organized around it and i, and I would say to complete co complexity again sensible and workable innovation that allows us to act is the best point of reference so if you're going to look at how we handled um, some of the closures of sites that were russia sponsored or, or officially or unofficially um, until we got to sanctions, we had to be very creative on what basis should be found. Majority of those websites do not have a big banner saying we are communicating this on the behalf of the Russian state. So, um, so that was that was an instance where where the lack of of, of legal basis or, or legal decisions was uh, was an obstacle. So we found a way how to work with governments and EU institutions on how to improve that. Um, how to improve that system. 
Then when it comes to recognizing or making decisions on, on, on content moderation, this is an ongoing exercise. And like, yes, the first few weeks when uh, the problem was very complex might have been a time where we were making mistakes and still learning. And we are in a completely different place today when, we're, when certain channels of communications are open, when we're organizing um, round tables that are not one of events, but are actually an, inf an information and knowledge um, exchange, and that should um, continue. We have all the language capabilities um, that are needed to be useful um, throughout this uh, war. So. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that we are in the, in the right place today to handle that complexity. When it comes to the particular question on your phone, I have to say it's, I, I, I don't know what's in your settings, but I would certainly um, start with that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really hard for me to address this particular... But um, you're definitely n nobody is targeted. Um, nobody is targeting targeting anyone with uh, this type of content uh, with a bad intention. Then, however, if we think about availability of Wikipedia um, in Russia and availability of platforms like YouTube, we think that this is actually good news. So I would say you having access to it is an unintended consequence. Um, of it, but I, but, but including everyone from the US government and EU institutions, I think um, everyone agrees that it's critical that some channels of access to information um, um, are still Very quickly, open. sorry to cut you off. Uh, I hear that Minister Fedorov will have to leave us soon. I just want to uh, give one, everyone in the room uh, an opportunity to thank him for participating uh, and uh, wishing you all the best. Thank you for, for coming today and offering uh, your, your, your very uh, salient and timely insights with us uh, straight from the front line. Thank you very much yeah. indeed, sir. Thank you, Mikhail, and good luck in everything. Thank you, Thank you Minister. Thank you very much. Um, fantastic. We, we still have a couple of minutes left. Um, any uh, further uh, audience questions in the room um, that, uh, that I can take? Uh, otherwise, we also have further questions on, uh, on Slido. Please, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Juraj Chorba, the Ministry of Investment and Inform Informatization. I have a question for Google, if I may. Uh, it seems that the online platforms, including yours, uh, tend to emphasize that you need a, a proper legal basis to be able to take down a particular specific item of content that is deemed either illegal or possibly harmful. Um, now, the case is, as has been already mentioned and explained in the previous question, then the content tends to uh, run away to uh, some other source that can be found later on on a different site or on a different place. So, given this, isn't it rather the case that uh, instead of uh, focusing on legal basis for uh, taking down of individual items, we rather need to have a closer look at the underlying software infrastructures that online platforms are using uh, when they amplify the spread of the content when they target individual users that are being targeted by your algorithms, your systems that you design and, uh, and that you uh, promote. Isn't it rather um, the better way how to actually be effective? I think it's certainly one of the ways to look into how information is amplified. But when you, when, when you look, for example, at the run-up to Digital Services Act, those act aspects have been considered and actually so-called big platforms today are well positioned when it comes to demoting content and, and not uh, bumping up content that would be deemed controversial or harmful. Indeed, like you say, the problem are very often smaller platforms that are then again not always captured by the, by the legislation that is being prepared by the European Union. And that's again a question of every coin has Decide. So on the one hand, there is an appetite to only regulate the big ones so that the small ones could, could, could still develop and grow. Then again, when we are 
um, when, when we are regulated and we are the only ones bound to do things, exactly like you say, users go to smaller platforms that do not need to meet the certain um, threshold and are not embraced by regulation. And this is getting very problematic with the youth, for example, that tends to escape from mainstream popular platforms to places where they can be stay away from the parental control for um, for example and um, same applies to um, same applies to same applies to free expression aspects uh, for example or uh, or actually being unable to respond to disinformation challenges one of the um, while we're very supportive of Digital Services Act. Uh, we've been in that position from very early on. We're again worried about some unintended consequences, given that um, it is a possibility as, that in the outcome of DSA, we will need to notify creators about demoting their content, why we did that, and they will be able to appeal. Imagine that this would be the case at the time of the war in Ukraine, when we would be taking down um, strongly disinforming media about the war in Ukraine and we would need to let the bad actors know about the fact that we took them down, why we did that, and we would need to give them an opportunity to appeal. So again, a very well-intentioned uh, a very well-intentioned regulation um, that had in mind bloggers from Slovakia who, whose content could go down, um, but then again, there is the second side. Um, of the coin. So again, back to your original question, definitely we should be looking into how the technology is constructed. And maybe I'm going to say something that will sound, sound disappointing, but it's, it's unfortunately very hard to find bad consequences of technology development with technology as such. And this turns out to be impossible because we see content, constant bypassing, coming up with new solutions. One pr platform is regulated, there will be another one. So. At the end of the day, it all goes down to digital skills and part of the hygiene of how we live in the 21st century and what kind of skills we should have to di differentiate and how to understand the algorithmic work, how to um, distinguish um, propaganda from authoritative uh, sources. Because if we're going to meet in this room in a year from now, we can talk about different platforms, same problems, but if we're not going to develop media literacy and those skills, this problem like will never go, will never go 100% away. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, we've come to the end of this uh, truly fascinating session. Some extremely interesting and insightful contributions from all the panelists. Clearly, the running thread is uh, how to structure the appropriate coordination between the private sector and the government in free societies. Uh, there are no final answers. This is a, a live and ongoing conversation to be had, uh, but I hope that it was uh, thought-provoking and insightful for you today. Please thank the panel. Join me in thanking the panel, uh, and after that, it's time for a short uh, coffee break. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.